Thanks for joining session number 25, A and B, of the course on mathematical methods for signal processing. It is my plan today to do some uh, MATLAB live experiments and in order to illustrate uh, the topic of Gabor multipliers. So what you see is a spectrogram con uh, um, yeah, produced with the STX program of the Acoustic Research Institute of our Academy of Science. And uh, I let it run now so that you can see my voice live recorded. And you can see depending on how I change my voice or maybe a whistle. You can ha have a very nice display of the current um, frequency. So the main frequency at any given time. So this is a function of the time frequency plane. And this is more or less all about you, uh, the basic understanding for time frequency analysis. And what we see here is um, uh, some high resolution spectrogram. I can ch change to, and to the left the length of the window. So here uh, the length of the window is approximately 112 milliseconds. So let's say it's about 4,000 uh, samples, which is something like 10 to the 12. Uh, so it, it chooses an FFT of that length. You can choose the overlap, you can choose minimal, maximal frequency thresholds and so on. But the idea of Gabor was that if you choose to the Gauss function, then you can uh, make it uh, make a sparse sampling and you can reconstruct from a sample spectrogram or as we will see equivalently, you can build the, the whole uh, function, I mean, the, all the functions from a system containing enough uh, frequencies at dense enough times. So somehow you can think of this, if you want to record my voice or an organ or whatever, um, and you're able to play, I would say program a, a, an organ, which is playing like a microtonal piano, but at discrete time steps and discrete frequency steps, we're still able to produce all the other things. So because everything which is happening in, um, in uh, a given moment in time and in frequency can be approximated by the neighbors. And by doing such an approximation, you can iterate and get an infinite sum for the things that are missing, so to say, between the lattice points. So now imagine that I would do something like a disturbing noise. So also to show you, I mean, I don't know if it works now, but uh, yeah, if you see there is a Dirac measure, which is just clicking somewhere, then uh, you might say, I want to get rid of this part maybe there is this little bird in the life performance, which does some uh, chirp signal in the, in, the, in the spectrogram and you would like to eliminate it. So the chirp would be something like in some place, but you say, well, here in this area, I would like to cut out the rest. And uh, so this is what you would do when you apply a Gabor multiplier. So the terminology is, related to Fourier multipliers. Fourier multipliers have been necessary to invert the Fourier transform. If the Fourier, tran Fourier coefficients decay not well enough, people found out that they can use some ability kernels, for me, decent functions in a zero, which uh, can be used to convolve the original signal with such a summability kernel in a Dirac-like manner. Or as we have seen, compression in the L1 domain with area preservation. So with delta zero at the, at the limit, you get a dilated or stretched version of the summability kernel Fourier transformed. And that goes to constant one on the Fourier transform side. But for each fixed row, it multiplies the bounded Fourier transform by something integrable. And that's allowing to apply the inverse Fourier transform form. So kind of this is the background, I would say the practical world. We have the uh, very uh, abstract, probably for you, mostly very abstract situation of uh, the theory that I have done so far. And now I want to come uh, to the numerical side. So um, I have already mentioned 
Let me see where I can get it. Um, you have seen already that for me, this idea of conceptual harmonic analysis is important. That means I'm not only interested in the abstract side, so kind of purely academic. I'm not only interested in the purely, um, um, purely uh, practical side, but I would like to combine it. So let me see how I can get my, my uh, window. So maybe, uh, so this is the MATLAB live script, which I have prepared and which will, we will go through step by step in order to illustrate to you the principles of time frequency analysis from the discrete point of view. So a person from abstract mathematics would say, oh yes, they are doing Fourier analysis and time frequency analysis over the group of order N, cyclic group of order N. Engineers would say, we are dealing with signals of, of length N. Okay, sorry, I see there is a problem with the live script. So, um, thank you. So, Abstract people would say we are doing Fourier analysis on a finite group. Engineers would say we are dealing with finite vectors. And of course, the difference is only that uh, normally you think for finite vectors that you get a finite collection of samples, let's say for, from an ongoing piece of music, whereas in the mathematical spirit, you would have a purely periodic thing. But you know, if you have a tape, which is playing the same recording over and over again, you normally would say, let's have a silent moment in between. So we have this periodic repetition, but if you only concentrate on one part, it's really very much the same. So we have seen this trick in the Shannon sampling theorem and in other situations. So it's really, so we have a good mathematical theory, which however can be viewed as a part of linear algebra. And that's why we can do everything just working with MATLAB. Okay, so the first thing is, a test matrix of size six is nothing else but having a six by six matrix where the index is already telling you what the position is inside of the matrix. So we uh, go through numbers one, two, and, and so on through the first column, then second column, and so on. So that's just to tell you what certain operators are doing. Uh, then I'm um, showing you uh, the side diagonal and uh, in this case you are saying the diagonal of course is diagonal with uh, number zero so we could also do that diag uh, m is the same as this diagonal with zero uh, m with zero i hope that also works and diagonal one one or m with minus one to show you also this would be uh, a side diagonal and it's in the naive sense of matrices. So you see here, the main diagonal is of course one, eight, 15 or so. The minus one, the side diagonal is two, nine. So if you go back, it's just the lower diagonal and the upper diagonal. So in a way it's taking a matrix as a collection of side diagonals. And we, for when we discuss convolution matrices, they will be circulant. Then of course, everything is understood in the in the um, in the cyclic way. So then you would say the main diagonal is first, then the side diagonal number one is seven, four, 21, and it's shorter by one. So you add this term here. The second side diagonal is this here and so. So I have actually a command, which I could also apply here, uh, which is side uh, digmat of M. And if I display it, it would just sort everything. You can check it. It maybe we go third side diagonal is starting with 19. Okay, so in this case, uh, it's uh, here. Yeah, we should be careful. We start with zero side diagonal one two, and uh, so 19, 26, 33 should, which has three entries. And next one, if you think of a periodic continuation, would be 4, 11, 18. And if you look at this, you have 19 and it's ending with 4, 11, 18. So sometimes it's reasonable uh, to, to sort, resort a matrix and bring it into this shape. 
where we will see especially the GABR multiplier or the matrix representing in a discrete setting a GABR, a, GABR, a GABR frame operator has a very nice structure if you take this viewpoint. Okay, now uh, the other thing is I have to remind you, uh, um, I'm, I thought it's easier, I stay with my conventions, that, that um, I like to work with row vectors, mostly because uh, whenever you would give me a collection of signals, I would look at them like a radiological doctor, which means I think the first signal is row number one, the second signal number two. Now, whereas standard matrix multiplication from the left, as we have it in the first two pages of the script, would correspond to linear combination of columns and your range of the matrix multiplication would be the column space. Now in my setting, you have to say, I have to put the coefficients first coming as a signal, as a horizontal row vector, and then you do a multiplication with the matrix and you get linear combinations of row vectors. Of course, it's very easy to replace one by the other. So there is no problem. Okay, now, uh, if I want to do this time frequency shift operators, which we have written by symbols Tx and Ms and so on, in the discrete setting, they are linear operators. In fact, they are unitary operators. They preserve the length of each vector and therefore uh, they have matrices. And what are the matrices? Well, they are just uh, the same uh, thing as, um, as uh, the collection of images under the linear mapping um, and um, of the unit vector, sorry. So your, your matrix is obtained by applying to the collection of unit vectors your operation. Now, my name for generating such an n by n matrix and for explaining it, it's just six by six is just uh, take a time frequency shift matrix for size n, six in our case. And if you do nothing, which is the identity operator, you get zero, zero. And of course, here you see the identity matrix to the left. Now, the other thing is we were saying we're doing time shift and then frequency shifts. That's why I put as a first argument after the dimension, the time shift parameter. And the time shift parameter means in this case uh, that the unit vector uh, is moving to the right in this case. So it's just x1 to x6 is going to um, x6, comma x1, x2 until x5. So this is how they're working. Now the uh, next thing is that the uh, frequency operator, time frequency shift that is, uh, is now a matrix of size 74, no shift and the pure frequency. And I was doing this uh, with the larger matrix and I was displaying the plot because you wouldn't see the real and the imaginary part if I just uh, show it. Either it's too short and you don't see the pure frequency. So here you see that, um, and that's why I had to explain the side diagonal. If you have a, a combined thing, maybe this, this is the interesting part, the last one. I think I should uh, put some plot maybe sure if it's necessary, but uh, if I would, uh, if I have a time frequency shift, which has a time shift by three, then I will have to take your here, here you see it differently. Um, I have to take the corresponding number of the diagonal because you see here, everything, when you do a time shift by one, everything is sitting on the upper side diagonal. If you do a negative time shift, everything is concentrated if you would start with a multiplication operator with a pure frequency, so you put just one of the rows of the free matrix into this here, you would have a modulation operator and combined with the shift, which is following it, everything would be moved around. So you see here, the cosine and sine functions are here, but if you combine it with the shift, this is kind of the matrix representation for the pure frequency. Cosine is real part, sine is imaginary part, and you have, uh, one full oscillation over the full period of n. You can play around and you can maybe we do it here with three. If you do three here, then you should uh, see no shift. We're looking at the main diagonal and we're seeing a pure frequency complex exponential function, which has three full periods and that's quite good. Okay, so we have seen that uh, the next thing would be 
uh, on, you have to choose the side diagonal. And I didn't take the full one. So if you would have a smaller and you would see it's a little bit shorter, but with the side stigmat command, we would have a perfect situation. Now, just as another uh, illustration, the spy command, but again, the centered spy command would show that we have uh, now 24 by 24 matrix with a time shift by five, which means it's having a side diagonal number five. And that here you see this concentration of a cyclic side diagonal. And there would be a frequency eight uh, in this, uh, in this uh, on, on this side, but the spy command just shows you there's non-zero entry only here. Now, uh, the important thing, of course, is that we can, we don't have to apply this matrix each time we want to do a time frequency shift, because after all, especially a cyclic shift is a very simple. So there's a routine, which I called rot mode. And the rot is coming from cyclic shift, which is due to the fact that on the cylindric representation of a periodic signal, we would have a rotation of the graph along the cylinder and the combined with the pure frequency multiplication. And of course, the arrangement is such that if I do my right matrix multiplication of a random signal with such a matrix, I'm getting the same as the operator. Of course, the rot mode is much more uh, efficient, but uh, it's good to be able to look at these matrices. Why? Because among others, um, I wanted to demonstrate that these time frequency matrices satisfy a certain orthogonality property. So if we look back at these, uh, these plots, then you would say, well, if they are, um, if the time shift parameters are different, then the matrices would be non-zero only at different uh, matrices. So maybe in this case, I would have plot uh, A1 in the red and A2 in blue, and it would sit at different things. So if you say, I look at these matrices as if they were images, uh, what does it mean? It means that you're considering these, uh, let's say my matrix at the beginning, not as a matrix with six columns and rows, but as an element of the 36 dimensional space. So usually I would call it the pixel matrix. I will take this as a pixel. And the gray value at position two, three is nine. The gray value at four, four is 22 and so on. But overall, it's just the standard command. Um, I mean, uh, I don't want to do it, but um, the standard command here, I have it, uh, where is it? Yeah, go from the matrix A to the vector. So A1, would be, uh, and I'm doing, I'm not showing it because, uh, uh, I mean, the matrices I don't show um, because it would fill the screen or so, but I can convert it. So for me, this command going from the matrix to the sorted list of coordinates within, with respect to the pixel, one pixel basis, so to say, in MATLAB order is nothing what is called the coefficient representation of the matrix with respect to the standard basis. Now you can do the same thing with uh, the other, with the second matrix. And if you do then a scalar product, so you're saying, okay, I take this color product as if they were just vectors of lengths n squared in our case. And then of course, taking this color product of columns vectors. And you see here why I may, why one of the reasons why I prefer to take row vectors, if you take column vectors and you take this color product of the A1 column vector with the A2 column vector, then you have to put the second one in the first place because you would like to do a conjugation and a transposition. And then of course, this is a, a one by N matrix with an N by one matrix. Uh, but it's exactly the right thing that you get, namely a scalar product in the sense of C n squared. Okay, and the answer you find here is here, it's zero. So they are orthogonal. And uh, also in order to illustrate it, I could take not only two such uh, uh, time frequency shift matrices, but I could do it for arbitrary n by n matrices and I put complex random matrices 
and I take this kind of scalar product. So identify a matrix with an image with a sequence of vectors, which is just the standard matrix. Uh, and then you would um, be able to find out that this scalar product that you have in the ordinary Euclidean sense is nothing else but the trace. So in functional analysis, you would argue that if somebody is giving you two very nice operators, B1 and B2, and they're Hilbert-Schmidt operators, you can form this trace class operator, trace of uh, this product. So B2 prime is the adjoint operator, um, but you're just doing matrix multiplication. The B2 prime means you're taking conjugation. And so at the end, it's really, a, I would say almost a stupid way to compute this color product. Here in this color product, you have n squared multiplications. What do you hear? In order to compute the product matrix, you are producing n squared pixels and each pixel is a color product. So you need n to the third multiplication just in order to take the trace, which is just the sum of the diagonal terms. So you're using only n out of n squared terms. So it's a redundancy in our case of 479 times what you would need otherwise. So this is a formal thing which is used quite often. Uh, but so I, for me, it's always when I see this, I say, oh yes, view at this point. Uh, now, uh, maybe I should also do something like uh, one more thing. Uh, that's uh, the norm of uh, matrix. So what is the norm of uh, a matrix? Maybe I take the second one. It's just uh, the, uh, why the, uh, the norm of the vector. So to say the Euclidean norm, or you take, uh, the, uh, sorry, no, that's not MATLAB. It's the square root of B2 with B2 prime. That's kind of how in the abstract setting, people would compute the, the Hilbert-Schmidt norm. They would say, it's like a Euclidean norm, but uh, okay, now square root of the trace, of course, trace of this here. Or you would say that's the norm uh, in this so called Frobenius norm. So that's FRO. So Mr. Frobenius was maybe one of the first people doing such things in a systematic way. And you see here, uh, well, my random command is made such that everything is normalized, but at least. In this case, you see, even if we wouldn't normalize it, uh, uh, we would uh, see, maybe I tried to, I'm not sure if this is doing the same thing, if it works right away. Um, yeah, here I have just another not normalized matrix, but you see these entries are really the same. So we are moving slowly from signals to operators or from uh, vectors to matrices. And in this context, I can show you a few things. So uh, the first thing is uh, the idea that, uh, well, if in my example, but as a general fact, these time frequency shift matrices are, a vector, uh, are, are, are orthogonal to each other. Uh, so maybe uh, I do something different also. I'm taking now a uh, time frequency shift matrix with n and I don't know, five and seven. And a two is a time frequency matrix with n and five, uh, five and minus three, four, okay. And I compute uh, a one scalar product. Oh, I should take a two, but it's not, the scalar product should be zero anyway, if I have no typo, a one. Uh, let's see what we get. Then we would see, uh, you see the minus 13, it's numerical precision. So they are numerical almost equal. Uh, now, if you want to do it mathematically, you would say, okay, in each of these entries, you have a certain side diagonal. In this case, it's side diagonal number five. So from the main diagonal, you, you go up five things, you make it in a cyclic way. So you would take entry number six of the side diagonal matrix. Now they are living, the entries, the non-zero matrices are in the same side diagonal, but you find pure frequencies. And of course we know 
that the free matrix is not only nice in many ways, but it has um, a collection of columns, the so-called pure frequency, which are orthogonal to each other. So because frequency plus seven and frequency minus four, which is of course the same as n minus four, if you would like to have a positive frequency, then it must be orthogonal. Okay, so the next thing is you're asking yourself how many time frequency shift matrices do we obtain? And uh, clearly we have n cyclic shift operators, we have n frequency shifts. So somehow could, you could say, oh, let's go back to the six dimensional case. We have 36 matrices. They are distributed in a nice way. So each of them is able to represent uh, every a, a matrix. So, well, if you decompose your six by six matrix into six side diagonals, and then, so with my side stigma, I can do that. And then I take the full coefficients of each side diagonal, then I would know how much I need uh, to, to get this um, contribution. So I will find that these are linear independent. I mean, first argument is I'm getting uh, 36 matrices, and if they're orthogonal as elements of a vector space with any scalar product here with a very natural scalar product, then they have to be a basis. So that's a dimension counting argument. The next thing is, well, how do you get the coefficients? Well, if it would be just a linear independent set, you would have to compute the coefficients by inverting some matrix, which in this case would be a n squared by n squared matrix. But now we have an orthonormal expansion. So what we are getting is a kind of abstract Fourier analysis now for operators with respect to this basis. And I have already indicated how we do it practically. We have MATLAB commands, which you can look up, but they are essentially saying, well, you give me a matrix. Uh, maybe we take the second one and I want to, uh, no, the first one, MAT to spread. You give me the matrix, and from, from the matrix, we, we, exp we go from the matrix to the spreading representation. That's the name of, the, of this new representation. Uh, and of course, spread to mud is the opposite, which turns uh, a matrix back from the spreading representation into a time representation. Okay, so the first thing once more is Every the spreading representation. So this 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 is the command. Uh, I call it now spreading of the matrix B. It's a random matrix here, um, and uh, also I would like to check. I'm not sure. Maybe I have it done uh, later on. If not, uh, we can do it once more. We have uh, normalized uh, this B in the Frobenius norm. So I can take just. Uh, the vector norm, but uh, that, that would be one thing. And now we are saying, well, we have converted it. And now, uh, of course, you would say, okay, we're taking a base, uh, a representation in a basis, uh, which is an orthonormal system. Now we should also check what is the length of, of the vector. So what is the length of, um, let me see, yeah. No, that's, uh, what is the length of each of these matrices in the Euclidean norm? Um, you see here, there is some number, uh, and uh, I would say, let's look at the one over N. Uh, no, so sorry, it's, it's just, it was unnecessary. Yeah. So the, the norm, should be an uh, n-fold, uh, let me see. Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I see. Now, what is, sorry, I would say, what is, let's say, take the identity matrix. If you look at the identity matrix, uh, what is the norm of the identity matrix taken in the Frobenius sense? Now, you would say, I have to take the unit vector, uh, uh, and the, the, you have to take one, 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 square each term, and you have n elements, and then you take the square root. So uh, what you have seen here, I got some number, which was 
wrong because I was forgetting about the square root. Yes, we are living in the n squared dimensional space. And by mistake, I was thinking, okay, square root of the dimension is the right thing. No, we have only n entries. And the same is true, of course, for every time frequency shift matrix. In absolute terms, you also have exactly n ones sitting on a cyclic side diagonal. And therefore, it's really having a property like the discrete Fourier transform or the FFT. Also, as a control, because I don't want to display it, the format of this spreading function is, of course, the same format. Now we have to think in the spectrogram, each pixel telling us about the intensity at a given time and frequency. So this graphical not a score, so to say. Now we have a completely different thing. We have operators. We're saying how much of the time frequency shift operator is in inside of the matrix. And then, of course, uh, you would like to say, I would like to plot in the horizontal direction the pure time shifts, in the vertical direction, the pure frequency shifts. And again, we have the same thing. I mean, uh, when we are uh, marking the time frequency points in the plane, that should be exactly the position of a pure time frequency shift. So again, in the spreading domain, you also have a basis. What are the unit vectors in the spreading? I mean, sorry, the unit pixel, one pixel matrices. So there's just one, one taken back to the time, to the matrix domain is of course a time frequency shift. So the um, spreading function is the basis, the expansion of every n by n matrix into a sum of pure time frequency shifts. Now, something that I think I did not uh, show or compute here is, and I want to spend too much time on it, how can you get the scalar product? Okay, you could take n squared scalar products, um, but as I have indicated, it's much more elegant to do this reshaping process, sort the matrix into side diagonals. Once you have this, take an ordinary free transform row or column wise, depending on how you did the arrangement. In our case, it would be column or row wise. So I would take that side diagonal matrix, uh, put it into column format, apply the FFT, and then put it back. And that would be the right thing. Now, uh, it's also good to know what is the identity operator. Well, the identity operator is, of course, no shift as we had at the very beginning. No shift, no, uh, sh uh, no shift and no modulation or modulation with frequency zero, which is constant one. And therefore in the spreading representation in the left upper corner of the matrix in the standard format, you will see the contribution of the identity operator. We also had for the case of discrete convolution, some discussion about how to invert an operator if it's not too far from the identity. And this is also now fruitful. So if we would see that a certain matrix has a good concentration of in the spreading domain, we would be able to argue very much in the same way as we did with discrete convolution, that it must be an invertible operator. Now, uh, what I'm doing here, sorry to show it a little bit differently, here is uh, to show that, of course, these procedures are inverse to each other. Yeah, here, here you see it. Uh, so converting from a random spreading function, a random matrix to a, to a spreading, and then back from the spreading to the matrix is giving you back the matrix and in the opposite direction. So you really have an invertible ma mapping. Now I'm not sure how much time I will have overall, uh, but in the continuous setting, I will tell you that this is actually not only a unitary transformation between Hilbert-Schmidt operators and L2 kernels, but it's even a banach gelfan triple isomorphism. So we will see that for continuous variables, if you have decent operators and decent spreading representation, everything is fine. Otherwise, you're doing it as you do it in the proof of the Plauscher theorem, you're approximating. Okay. The next thing that I would like to explain to you in preparation of more details about Gabor frames is uh, a little bit of what is uh, the, the, I mean, an important object in 
and time frequency analysis is the window for the short time Fourier transform. Now in my situation, I'm not repeating it because it's a bit slow. Uh, this G is the discrete Gauss function. It's um, um, signal length is 480. So what we really do is we take, we have seen uh, squared is about, let's say 21 plus something. So we are periodizing the Gauss function at the rate of 21, which means practically we're sampling from minus 10 to plus 10 or 10.5. And the sampling rate is one over 21, roughly, roughly. So that would be a Gauss function, which is really FFT invariant. So up to normal as after square root of n, of course. Now, uh, uh, I see there, you should, there was a figure, uh, I should put a figure, but I don't want to repeat it here. To see, you would see a blob in the centered image representation. So it's not uh, good to use the image scale of VGG. It's better to use the image scale of absolute value of VGG, but it's much better to rotate, uh, to put it in the center. Now, uh, what I also want to show you here is uh, a lattice. Now we have a small command called let point NAB, which would give for our time frequency analysis with time shift 20 and frequency shift 16, would give you the lattice with the according uh, lattice points. Now we have to recall that we are working now with matrices and for matrices, the description of format and so on is typically in how many rows, how many uh, columns do we have? So you always, you remember an M by N matrix is mapping RN into RM. So it looks as if it was going into the wrong direction I assign it again to matrix multiplication rules, but of course, A with X is a linear combination of column vectors, and each of the columns are in RM, and that's why it's very natural to do like this. So we are going to do a lattice matrix. So it's a matrix of format N by N, where we are saying which of the time frequency shifts, again, sorted in the natural time frequency way are part of this. And here we take two integers, which are uh, divisors of the signal length. So A, 20, of course, means we have 24 positions, N over A possible uh, vertical lines, which are occupied with uh, entries, which are at this distance of uh, 16. Another uh, 16 times 30 is 480. So if you look at the graph here, it's a centered graph. So this is coordinate number one, one, but put into a plot, it looks like it was zero, zero. We would go down by 16, 16 and so on. So in MATLAB coordinates, it's one, 17, um, 33 and so on. And here horizontally, it's horizontal zero, which is one plus 20 is 21, 41, 61 and so on. Minus uh, 20, of course, is uh, 20 away from the maximal and so on. So you'll see it's, it would be of course uh, 461, 441. And these are all these lattice points and we see it's 720 points. So it's compared to the number, the dimension of our signal space, which is 480, the redundancy is three over two. So if somebody is giving you a certain number of vectors which generate the vector space, then we call it the, I call say multiplicative redundancy constant is the division of how many vectors compared to the dimension. So normally I would show you my open hand and show you my five fingers in the general positions. And I would say, this is for me, the typical frame of redundancy five over three for our three dimensional Euclidean space. Okay, so here, you are seeing something which is also good to know or remember. I'm forming essentially two SHA distributions, Dirac comps if you want. Uh, the one is the horizontal one uh, and the vertical one. So the V is the horizontal Dirac comp. It has entries at coordinate number one, and I cannot show it, 21, 41 and so on. And you have a vertical Dirac comp, which has entries again at position one up to 17. 
but we are not taking a scalar product, but we are doing matrix multiplication. We are putting U or we having U in a vertical position and, and V in a horizontal position. And if we multiply this N by one column matrix, with the one by N row matrix, we're getting a matrix. And look up what you get in terms of entries. If you would do it for general vectors, you would just get uh, the, the table of multiplication. So at each entry, there's only one product and it's the product of the two numbers that you have in the row and column position of the generating elements. So the abstract way of looking at this is to say, we're doing a tensor product of these two vectors. Uh, and this is an N by N matrix. And it's giving you an, um, it's just a matrix or so. Now, uh, I call this lattice lambda, uh, and uh, I'll show you a, a localized version, otherwise you wouldn't see much. Uh, therefore, I'm doing a, a zoom here, and I'm doing at the same time uh, this, uh, yeah, this cont C is a contour plot of our short time Fourier transform, which actually is a two-dimensional Gauss function up to phase factor. So in terms of absolute values, it's just a two-dimensional Gauss function. And I show the contour. So roughly speaking, what we would say is, if you're asking me, can I use this window for this lattice? Then I would look at the covering of the plane of the yeah, phase space by the concentration or by the energy which is found in the VGG. So here you would say, the circle clearly is, uh, is covering enough area, but it's a circle that is doing everything fine. So probably we should do a threshold and say, well, if you would put things too far apart, uh, then maybe those circles would not cover anymore and you would get at least a bad frame or not even a frame at all. There is no exact way of doing this if you want to have this idea that if a lattice is chosen in such a way that it covers, I mean, that the circles cover uh, the face space, that then you can be sure that it's a frame. And in the same way, if they're disjoint, then they are linear independent, but roughly speaking, it's the same. You see here, if you would make the lattice much coarser, uh, let's say 2A and 2B, you would get a redundancy of a quarter of three over two, uh, which would uh, be um, just, well, three over six would be one half. You would have half as many points or elements in the corresponding cover system as you have in the, in the single space. And clearly you never can span all the vectors in an n-dimensional space if you're only having n, uh, one, or n over two elements. Okay, so, um, every point now is representing an operator. So I could take matrix with only one at this position, make an operator apply to the Gauss function that would be the same as just call, building this Gabor basic collection in the product pattern. So that means I only uh, say that I have to put A and B, the lattice constants. If you would give me a more general lattice, uh, then I would uh, be able to form an oblique basis, maybe I'm doing this here. Uh, LAM1 is uh, side digmat. I know that this is a possible way of doing it. Um, maybe I'm saying G1 is GAP bus, GAP, uh, not, not, not a product anymore, but it's with the Gauss family with the lambda one, but I would like to show you uh, this lattice. So make a figure. And do again the same spice lam one. Hopefully, it doesn't take too long. And essentially, you, we would. Uh, I would like to show you that this oblique lattice. Uh, okay, there is a there was a typo. Sorry. Uh, maybe put one section break, and then I'll only repeat this one. So uh, we should see now uh, a lattice which is oblique and you can do the same trick here. Uh, so maybe I'm just showing you the G1 
GD1 is the a pseudo inverse. So if it's representing everything, then the pseudo inverse of the transpose conjugate of this matrix should give you the inversion theorem. GD1 is uh, just the first guy in this family. You remember I have a col collection of column vectors and I rebuilt, uh, I want to compare. If I rebuild uh, from either, either take this pseudo inverse of a Gabor matrix corresponding to a lattice, or I'm doing it uh, in just from this only one element, it's G D1, yeah, uh, and uh, lambda one, then we should see that this is the same result. And of course, uh, yeah, you see here the result is fine. So we can say that for any lattice, uh, the Gabor family, if it's generating the n-dimensional space, then everything is fine. We could also look at the condition number of our Gab of our Gabor frame, uh, or uh, also ask what is the condition number of G1, and we would find that they are probably not bad, um, and that represents the way, so to say, the cost of representation. Uh, that you have. Okay, it's interesting here because the second one is even slightly better. I can tell you from experiments, uh, many experiments, the more hexagonal like uh, such a group looks for the same, it's the same number of points, the better it is. So it's only slightly better, uh, but in both cases, I would say condition number less than 10 is very fine from a numerical point of view. And that simply means if you want to represent a vector of length one, um, or if you have an error in your STFT of 5%, it's only multiplied with such a factor in the reconstruction process. And that's a very good situation. Let's try, I think I will uh, go on a little bit. Uh, yeah, or maybe I'll stop here, yeah. Let's do a break now and I will continue with the MATLAB uh, live script later on. So 